It's good to be in the house of God. It's good to be here again. Me and my wife love coming here. I love seeing y'all. Love the church. And uh, it always feels like coming home to me. That's what it feels like. And there's no place like home, right? That's right. Yes, ma'am. Good. Oh, good. Yeah. Oh, good. Good. You tell him I said hi. I love him. All right. Good. Good, good. I want to talk about something tonight that um, affects all of us, teenager, kid, adult, senior saint, doesn't matter, but we all need one thing from God, and that's His guidance. We all need God's guidance. No, no matter where your walk is, where you're at in your walk of faith, what your age is, uh, if you're still in school, if you're out of school, it does not matter. Every one of us needs God's guidance. So who does he guide, how does he guide, and where does he guide? Those are the three questions that we need to answer, right? And so just a quick, quick here's a quick fact about the Bible. Uh, the Bible was written over a period of more than 1,600 years. Some say 2,000, 1,600, 2,000. That's still a long time, is it not? And there was more than 40 authors who wrote on three different continents in three different languages, right? Yet... And they wrote on hundreds of controversial subjects, yet they all line up perfectly. And that, that, that's why is that? Because it comes from God, that's why. You could take three men that have the exact same degree and stick them in a room, and all three of them have different ideas about everything from tires to guns. They couldn't line up on everything. But the Bible does. It lines up on everything, on every subject. Why? Because it comes from God and God alone, not from man. And so... Open your Bible with me to Psalms chapter 25 and verse 9. We're going to start there. Psalms chapter 25 and verse 9. God's divine guidance is promised to the obedient. Did you know that? God's divine guidance is promised to the obedient. You know, it's good to fast and pray, get God's guidance. Lord, what would you have me to do? Where would you have me to go? But... He makes it clear that obedience is better than sacrifice. Amen. Absolutely. Amen. Obedience is better than sacrifice. So in Psalms chapter 25 and verse 9, the Bible says, The meek will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way. Let's pray. Lord, as we bow before you tonight, we just thank you for the fine folks that showed up to hear your word, God. I pray that you would uh, use me to just flow the truth through me, God, to uh, convict and exalt and exhort your people. And uh, just watch over them, Father, as the church looks for, for the right man, Lord, and, and bring it to them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And so the Bible says, the meek will he guide, and the meek will he teach his way. And that word does not sound great in the world today. It doesn't. If you go out and tell somebody I'm meek, they would just automatically look down upon you. What do you mean you're meek? You're weak. No, you're not. That, 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 doesn't, that doesn't mean that you're weak. It does not at all. No, but you are strong enough to know that you need to humble yourself before God to get His guidance, right? It takes a very strong person to hold back when you know that you can do something, but you say, you know what? I'm going to wait on God. I trust Him, right? And so the Bible says, the meek will He guide, and the meek will He teach His way. If, if we're teachable... We're meek. Uh, we soon learn what is right and what is wrong in the will of God. Uh, and the single most important thing we need to learn is humility. Humility. You know, we have pride naturally. Pride is built in from the factory. We already have it installed when we come into the world. It's here, right? But humility has to be installed. It has to be learned. You have to learn it. You have to apply it every, each and every one of us. Because pride can swell up real easy and you won't even know it. It's just a little at a time, a little at a time. But you have to learn and install humility. It doesn't come from the factory. Oh, no, it sure doesn't. But pride does. Pride comes naturally. It does. 1 John 2.16, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. What did he say there? That pride of life, it's not from Father, it's not from God. It is from the world. It swells up within us. It comes out within us. You know, 
it's a trap, it's a trick of the human heart. Nothing satisfies in this world. There's no worldly possession that can satisfy. And if you, I like to study some people's lives, and an interesting character is John D. Rockefeller, if you all heard of him. Oh, yeah. he, he, he was the multi-multi-millionaire billionaire of the early 1800s, and he owned a lot of the oil in this country. Oh, yeah. He had so much money back then that if he had the same amount today, he would make Donald Trump look like Donald Trump. That's how much money that he had. But if you study his life, when he got to the end of his life, all of a sudden he started giving away all this money. He started giving away, he gave $158 million away out of his own pocket. He built medical centers and libraries and research centers. And those are good things. But I don't believe the man was saved. I think he was searching for something to satisfy that longing inside of him. And nothing can satisfy that except God. Nothing. And so, Proverbs 16, 18, Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Pride goeth before destruction. So if a person's starting to swell up with pride, careful, destruction is not far around the corner because it says pride cometh before destruction. It was pride that caused Lucifer to fall from heaven. It sure was. Pride in his heart caused him to fall from heaven like a, like a bolt of lightning. And you know, God will take a, a, a stuck up person and he'll humble them sometimes. And let me tell you, it hurts a whole lot less if you will humble yourself and unless God has to humble you. If you will humble yourself instead of God having to humble you, it will hurt a whole lot less, I promise you. If you realize, hey, I need to humble myself. I need to take two steps back and realize I'm nothing and I'm nobody except for God's servant. That's all that I am. And so here's the thing about that. And it's usually the tallest tree that gets struck down by lightning. You ever notice that out in the world? It makes me want to go like this, you know, because it's usually the tallest tree. So the one that looks like they're the biggest, God may strike them down with lightning just to bring them in check, to deflate their ego, if you will, because God hates pride. A proud person God hates. In Proverbs 6, 16, he says, Six things does the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. The first one he lists is a proud look. That's the very first one. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood. God hates. He hates that. And that's something, isn't it? And God will, you know the most prideful people, I think, are the religious crowd. I believe that. I think they're some of the most prideful. Absolutely. And turn with me now to Malachi chapter 2. Malachi chapter 2. <coughs> And let's see how God deals with a uh, religious, prideful crowd. Because you know what a religious, prideful crowd wants, don't you? They want the glory for themselves. Look at me. See who I am? They call me, some call them father, some call them, they have all these different names. And we're going to look at that too, what the Bible has to say about that. But let's see what God thinks about a prideful religious crowd. In Malachi chapter 2 and verse 1, the Bible says, And now, O ye priests, this commandment is for you. If ye will not hear, and if ye will not lay it to heart to give glory unto my name, saith the Lord of hosts, I will even send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. And I'll have cursed them already, because ye do not lay it to heart. Behold, I will corrupt your seed and spread dung upon your faces, even the dung of your solemn feast, and one shall take you away with it. And ye shall know that I have sent this commandment unto you, that my covenant might be with Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. Wow. You think God's going to humble him there? He says, you, you religious people, you religious prideful people, if you won't give me the glory, you won't give my name the glory, he said, I'll spread dung upon your faces. Well, that's pretty strong language, isn't it? That doesn't need an explanation. God says, I'll humble you and humiliate you if you don't give me the glory and me the honor because you don't deserve it. You don't deserve it. And that's what he told these priests here. You don't give me the glory, I'm going to humble you. That solemn feast, that great feast that you hold up so much, I'm going to take the dung from that and spread it all over your face for everybody to see. You go, wow, it's pretty strong coming from the Lord, isn't it? But that's how strongly God thinks about it. 
So you think about these religious crowds today. What does God think of them? Because he hasn't changed his mind. He still thinks the same thing. And you say, why would you bring this point up, Brother Mike? Well, the Bible says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. That's Hosea 4, 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Turn with me now to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew 23. And here in, in Matthew 23, the whole chapter, Jesus is rebuking the religious crowd. Many times, Christ gave so much grace to, to the harlot at the well, to the beggars, to the people that were nobody, but he hardly and harshly rebuked that religious crowd. He did not hold his tongue. He was not soft and easy with them. He put it out there. He laid it on the line for them. So Matthew chapter 23, let's look at verse 6. And here he is rebuking them and telling them what they love. And love the uppermost rooms at feast, and the chief seats in the synagogues, and greetings in the markets, and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But be not ye called Rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and ye are brethren, and no man your father and call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. In other words, don't call no man rabbi. And it also says, don't call no man father. You know what religion I'm talking about, where they call him father this and father that? Christ said, call no man father, except for your father in heaven. All right? And so right there, he's rebuking him. And that still stands strong today. Strong today. Absolutely. So God, God hates the proud, but God loves the humble. He certainly does. He loves the humble, and his arms are wide open to the humble. James 4, 6, But he giveth more grace. Wherefore, he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. So are you humble today? If you do, God's got all the grace in the world for you. He just cover you with it, more than you can actually stand. But if a person's prideful, he's got nothing for you but rebuke and harsh times. And he's probably going to humble you. Like I said, the tallest tree is usually the one that gets struck down by lightning. Does it feel good? Absolutely not. But it's for their benefit. Because if, if you're a child of God, we were talking about this in Sunday school, that you love your kid and you have to whip them. Right? And that kid thinks, man, that's a terrible thing. The parent says, this is going to hurt me worse than it hurts you. And God feels the same way. He doesn't want to have to do that to us. Absolutely not. Why? Why do you do it to your kid? It's not for you. It's for them. It's because you love them. And that's what God does to us. Because He loves us. Amen. It's to keep us straight. To keep us right. To keep us close to Him. Because as you drift further and further away, the further you get away from God, the more destruction there's going to be. Yeah. Absolutely. Amen. Absolutely. And so God loves you enough that He puts something in your life to draw you back to Him, right? To make you go get your own lamb. Ain't that right, Brother Brandon? Get your own lamb. <laughs> oh, I'll tell you a little story about uh, Brother Brandon. He was my seventh grade science teacher, and we thought he was the coolest guy. I never told him this, but he would take us outside. None of the other teachers did this. And we'd walk around the woods, you know. And you never know what you, how much you influence people's lives, I'm telling you, because I still remember what he said that day. We went outside. There was a little creek out back, and there was these trees that, I guess they're weeping willow trees that had the long leaves, yep. and the Indians would crush them up and make like aspirin out of them. Is that right? Yep. And he would explain that to us and showed us a branch. And You might not remember showing me that, but I, I remember every word he said that day. So when you're talking to kids, you, you never know what they're going to remember what you tell them. Hopefully, your words are, are good and encouraging and because this is probably going to stick with them for a long time, you know. It will. And so, God promises to be a guide unto the end of your life. Not just for the next five years, ten years, but all the way to the end of your life. To the very last day. To that last breath. Like we were talking about this morning, when, you, when a person goes to die... And a, a person has dying grace, like that man that was dying. He never had a worry in the world. And another man said, well, I don't have dying grace. And a guy said to him, that's because you're not dying. <laughs> you don't have dying grace. God gives you the grace that you need at that time, right? At that time. He'll intervene. 
And so a guide until the end of your life. Psalms 48, 14, For this God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even unto death. Even unto death. All the way to the very end. And then God's waiting on the other side. Right? Amen. God will guide your, your steps down a safe path through life. He gives you that promise, you know. I'm not saying there won't be trials and tribulations because there will. But God has the best path for your life. You can bet on it. But there will be trials and tribulations. The Bible says, 2 Timothy 3.12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Suffer. It doesn't say we might or we could. No, it says shall. There's no getting out of that. No matter where you're at. We might, we might have a little persecution here in America. And in North Korea they have a lot. But there ain't no getting out of it. It says shall. You will. You can bet on that. Because a, a light in a dark room shines whether you want it to or not. People are going to notice it and they're going to see it. And so, you know the value of a promise depends on the promiser. God has and never will break his word or his promise. That, you know, a, a man's only as good as his word. You've heard that, right? You know, if a, every man's word was good, we would not need all these contracts and lawyers and binding agreements. And you ever buy a house? Man, you need, there's a big jar of pens there, and you're probably going to need all of that ink, and you're going to get, a, you know, a cramp, and you're going to get writer's block and all kind of stuff while you're signing all them documents. And we was there half the day just to buy a house. And it's because people's words are no good. And that's so they can legally bind you to that. This is the agreement. You're stuck with it. But with God, His word is good as gold. And He, he does give you a binding contract. Here it is right here. He's hard to give it to you. His word. And we're going to look at what He says, how high He holds His word in Psalms. In Psalms. And so, in other words, a person is no better than their word. So what does, what does God have to say about that? Uh, turn with me to Psalms 138. I want to show you all. Some of you may know this and some of you may not. But turn to Psalms 138 and verse 2. Psalms 138 and verse 2. Let's look at how much God, how high God holds His word. Psalms 138 verse 2. The Bible says... I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. God says, I hold my word above all my names. Not just a name. It says all thy names, Jehovah, Emmanuel, God, Jesus Christ. He said, I hold my word above all my names. In other words, this is the most important Thing. I will not break my word. He gives you that guarantee. My word is solemn. It does not give. It does not break. It does not yield. Right? It is an agreement. Absolutely. For thou hast magnified that word above all thy name. When I found that, I thought, wow, that's an amazing thing, isn't it? It sure is. It sure is. So guidance by wise counsel. Psalm 73, 24, the Bible says, Thou shalt guide me with wise counsel, and afterwards receive me to glory. There is nothing wrong with getting wise counsel. Nothing wrong. But when you go to a counselor or preacher or pastor, make sure you ask the right questions. Don't ever say, what would you do or what you think I should do? No, you ask him, what do you, th what do you think God's word says that I should do? That's what you should ask him. That's the right question. What do you think God's Word? And show me. Show me so that I can study it and read it for my life. That's the question to ask. What would God have me to do? You know, despite my ignorant mistakes like loving parents holding a child's hand, God leads me to safety if I will listen to wise counsel. If I was, let's look at it like this. If I went on this hunting trip, right, to Saskatchewan, Canada, that's where I'd like to go, fly out there in a helicopter, they drop you off and you know, 900 miles from nowhere out in, the, out in the mountains and you get a guide and you hunt elk, you know, that'd be awesome, wouldn't it? And we fly out there and he drops me off out of the helicopter and I got my guide and I say, 
I don't need you. And he says, well, I've been here before. I know all the territory. And I say, nah, I get lost. I got this. I'd be an idiot, wouldn't I? I'd be a fool. I'd be lost. I'd be dead, right? And that's what a person's doing when they reject God's guidance. God says, I've been there. I know how to do it. I know what's best for you. I know which way we should go. But yet if we just push it away, it's just, it's just that simple to you think that person would be crazy, a fool to leave a guide like that out in the middle of nowhere. You're going to die. It's the exact same thing when you push off God's guidance. Absolutely. You say, yeah, but I know what I want. And that's where it boils down to. It's not what's best for you. It's, it's all about, it'll all, Satan will always appeal to self. Always appeal to self. What about you? Look, look what they're doing. Look what you're having to do. Look how much you're doing and look what, how little they're doing. Look what all the stuff that you've gave and look, they've gave nothing. He's always going to appeal to self. Why? Because we're naturally selfish. We are. We've got to die daily. Absolutely. Guilty. Done that. Been there. Had that thought. Absolutely. And so, just like that person that said, Nah, I don't need no guide. I don't need you. I got this. You know what the Bible says about that? Proverbs 12, 15. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes. But he that hearketh unto wise counsel is wise. Right? It's wise to get wise counsel. Absolutely. What should I do? Where I should go? How I should do it? Right? Show me in God's word what, what is right for my life. And the Bible also says, Where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. There is safety. That's Proverbs eleven, fourteen. 14. So in other words, when there's no counsel... If there's just kids in here and they're running the church, in other words, and there's not the gray-haired people watching out for the best interest of the church, it won't be long the church will be a wreck. I guarantee you why. Because there's no wise counsel. That's why. That's why. If you get a bunch of people in here that's 20 years old and they just want to take over and run everything, well, it's probably going to go the wrong way. Why? Because there's no wise counsel. That's why. That's why. That's what the Bible says. Where no counsel is, the people fall. And there is a world full, full, full of churches that are so unbiblical and worldly. You don't know if you're going into a movie theater, a rock concert, or a so-called church. You don't know what it is. If you have to walk into a church and go, wow, you don't even feel like you're in a church, then there's something wrong. Just march yourself right out of there. You can bet on it, right? Because that's the last thing you want to do is make a sinner feel comfortable when they come into the church. You want them to be welcome and love them and happy and put your arms around them. Praise God. Get right with God. Get saved. Amen. But you don't want to turn this place worldly to make them feel comfortable because right. you'll have no influence in your community or in this world. They'll say, they don't, they don't even really believe what they're saying down there. Look, they live just like us. That's what they'll say. Why, why should we bother changing? They don't mean anything. And so... The people fall. And you know when God guides, when God calls, when God talks, He usually doesn't corner you up with a bullhorn. No, He doesn't. He, do, he doesn't write you a uh, certified letter where you have to sign for it. And He certainly doesn't drop from, something from the sky. But, but what He does is He gets that still, small voice and He speaks to you. And when you finally, when you finally settle down, and you hear that voice, and then you run around in circles, and you got to do this, and I got to do that, and I got to make this happen, and I got to go here. And when you finally stop and listen, that still small voice is still there saying the same thing. I've heard it over and over, and I can hear it. Michael, I told you. Michael, I told you. Michael, I told you. I can hear it clear as a bell sometimes. And it's, he's always the same, that still small voice. And you just have to be humble enough to hear it. That's what it is. You got to humble yourself enough to hear it. Turn the volume down enough in your life to hear it. The worst thing that you can do, and here in America, man, we are bad about this. I am. I am one busy man. I got a job that demands a lot of my attention, and I get so wound up, and I got so many things that I, I'll forget to pray sometimes, or run out the door, or do my Bible study, or or this or that. And this world will get you so wound up and caught up. Got to go. Got to go. Got to go. Got. We in a hurry. This whole world is in a hurry. If you don't believe me, the next time you're at a green light and it turns green, just sit there for two seconds see yeah. what happens. 
See what happens. Man, they'll blow the horn. They might run over. They might get out and whoop you. You just don't know. I mean, they're in a hurry. And I, I feel myself getting that way sometimes. And I get to the drive through I'm like, I just want to get a cheeseburger. And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, what in the world is taking so long? It's just a cheeseburger. You know, I realize, why am I in such a big hurry? What is my problem? Right? Just slow down. And that's the best thing you can do to hear God is just slow down. Get in the prayer closet. Get on your knees and ask God to speak to me. Speak to me, Lord. Show me your will, your way, your wants for my life. And he will. If you really seek him, you'll hear him. You can bet on that. You can bet on that. God says, if you seek me, you'll find me if you seek me with your whole heart. You know, when Elijah was, was having the battle with the, with the 450 prophets of Baal, and they built the altar, and the fire came down and consumed it, Afterwards, there wasn't a great trumpet in the sky that said victory or, or there wasn't this big explosion. Oh, no. The Bible says in 1 Kings 19, 12, and after the fire, a still, small voice. A still, small voice. Amen. And that's how God's going to speak to you, too. A still, small voice. But the thing is, are you listening? Have we slowed down enough to hear God speaking to your life have you got on your knees do you have a place in your house that is designated that this is where me and God do business that's a big thing you know why it's like setting the atmosphere when you walk into a restaurant and they have a certain lighting and a certain music it just sets the atmosphere when you walk in the church it sets the atmosphere you're in the church when you have a place and that place that's all it's for is for you and God meet there you and God do business there when you get to that place, there's no wondering why you're there or something else might come up. No, that's what that place is for. You and God meet. You pour your heart out. You give your burdens to God. You ask for guidance from God. You give God all your grief. You say, Lord, I need your help. That's what that place is for. And I'm telling you, that makes a big difference in your prayer life. It really does. Because that place is for nothing else except for where God gets a hold of you and you get a hold of God. Amen. Absolutely. And so if you don't have that place, think about making one. Get you a chair. It doesn't have to be nothing fancy. Old, old metal chair does great. That's all you need in the corner. A two-by-two two spot won't take up much space. Put your prayer requests on the wall and, and you and God meet. There you go. Say, Lord, here's my heart. I, I need you to show me what you want. Show me your will, your way, and your wants. For my life. Right? Alright, with that let's pray. And, and, uh, and we'll close. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for those fine folks that showed up, God. And we just thank you for this church. We love coming, love to preach. Love the people here, God. I pray that you bless it, Lord. Just watch over it. Keep them safe. And uh, take us home safe, God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.